Welcome. In this video, I am going to talk about a very important tool in computational physics, namely the NumPy array. Uh, NumPy, as most of you know, is a module in Python which allows you to do many, many interesting mathematical calculations. By the way, uh, whether the name is pronounced NumPy or NumPy depends entirely on you. Uh, and I tend to switch from one pronunciation to the other. So if I sometimes call something NumPy, sometimes NumPy, rest assured that I'm talking about the same thing. I will try not to switch pronunciations too much, but I can't really guarantee that. Now, to begin with, let me point out that I'm focusing on only one aspect of the NumPy module here namely the basic data structure, the NumPy array. The reason why I am doing this is that once you understand the NumPy array properly, you essentially have all the tools that you need to use NumPy in a very, very important way. Now, of course, uh, my talk will not be only on the array and that will be rather dry. So what I will do is I will also talk a bit about how to use the NumPy array in various applications. But, to be, but I, as you can see, I do have a presentation. However, it's much more fun to actually keep on doing the thing alongside. So I will sort of switch between a presentation and a demo on my computer system of how the NumPy array thing works. So let's take a look. First of all, if I want to use a NumPy array, or anything in NumPy, we must start with a basic mantra. We have to import the NumPy module so that Python knows the name NumPy. Now, if I just say import NumPy, as uh, those of you who are familiar with Python know, for later applications, you will always have to use a construct like NumPy dot followed by the name of whatever thing you want to take from NumPy. Now that's fine, except the typing NUMPY is not really a great thing to do all the time. So there is a very convenient and conventional shortcut. Uh, this is not necessarily something you have to do, but almost everybody in the world does it, at least everybody who uses NumPy that is. So what we do is we import NumPy as NP. Once you do that, all the goodies that NumPy gives you are available. All you have to do is say NP, that's what NumPy stands for now, followed by a dot and then you have to give the name of whatever you want. Now, the most useful object in NumPy is the array and that's the one we are going to focus on in this lecture. And creating a NumPy array is really very easy. But to see this, let me give you a live demo. So for that, what I need to do is first start Python. This is the Python interpreter that I'm using. This is the, this is the no frills basic Python interpreter. And all it does is asks you for one instruction and it carries it out then and there. The first thing I will have to do in the demo is of course invoke our basic mantra, which is import numpy as np. This takes a bit of time because after all NumPy is a large module. There's a lot of things for Python to learn at this stage. Now, the next thing I will do is strictly speaking not exactly necessary for a NumPy array demo. However, many of the things that we will do will benefit from a visual presentation. So I want to be able to plot the results of what I'm doing. For that, I'm going to use another Python module which talks very ni nicely with NumPy. This is called matplotlib. Maybe I will make that the subject of a further video later. But for the time being, I'm going to use the pyplot in matplotlib. And anything you want to use from there would have to be called matplotlib.pyplot. That thing. So, in order to really simplify the typing, 
I'm going to do as PLT. This again is conventional. You don't have to call this PLT, but the world over everybody does. So now I'm ready with two things. NumPy is available in my namespace, but it's not called NumPy, it's called NP. And matplotlib.pyplot is available via the name PLT. So let's get down to actually creating some NumPy arrays. Suppose I have a list like this. So this is a list which really has three elements, L0, L1, and L2. But each of these three elements are themselves lists. They're actually two element lists. So three elements, each of them, two element lists. Now, before we learn NumPy, this essentially is the closest we get to the mathematical construction of a, of a matrix. This thing sort of looks like a three by two matrix. Three elements each, a two element list, translates sort of to three rows and two columns in the matrix scenario. And before we learn NumPy again, this is the best we, and closest we can get to matrices and we can use such lists within lists to carry out our matrix manipulations. However, as we will soon see, the NumPy array provides a much, much better and much more efficient way of doing matrix calculations than lists within lists. So how do you create a NumPy array out of this? Well, the simple thing is to use the np.array command. Remember, np is the name of the NumPy module as far as we are concerned because that's how we have imported the NumPy module. And now that we have the NumPy module imported as np, any function which is there in the NumPy module, I will have to call that using np dot. So array is the name of a function which the NumPy module provides. So what I will do is I will type in the command aa, which of course is just a variable name, equals np dot array l. Notice that since l is the array out here, Then carrying out this command is exactly the same as carrying out what the current command was in my on my slide. I just don't have to write out the whole array, whole list of lists inside the ar argument for the array. I can just say L. And now my NP array has been created. To see what kind of an object it is, we use a standard Python function. We just a type followed by the name of the object and it tells you what kind of an object it is. It tells you numpy dot nd array. Uh, the nd here stands for n-dimensional. So you can actually have an n-dimensional thing here. The important thing is a numpy array is not restricted to one or two dimensions. It can actually have many, many more dimensions, which something which you call axis. And so, in general, it's an n-dimensional array. And what does it look like to Python? All I have to do is type a and see what does it say. It says array. And now notice that unlike the list, this has been formatted in a rather different manner. If I just looked at the list L, it would have given you this. The array a, on the other hand, differs in the fact that, first of all, there's a word array and a round bracket, even when you want to just type out what array is. And inside, the row by column nature of this array is being displayed properly. Okay, so now we have an array. What do we do with that? Well, let me just show you some examples of how important or useful an array can be. If you just take a look at the array AA and say AA plus 1, notice what has happened. 
You have added 1, not to one element, but to all the elements at the same time. Well, a into 2 works just fine. Every element of the array AA gets doubled. But well, things don't stop here. You can actually do something like np dot square root. This is of this of course is a square root function from the numpy module. If I invoke this or if I use this function with a the array as an argument, notice what happens. Every element of the array undergoes a square root function. So the this is a feature of the numpy universal functions or u funcs which most numpy functions are, they act on every element of an array in parallel. I don't have to write an explicit for loop or some other loop structure to be able to do this. Just give the array as an argument a universal function. Every element of the array will be acted upon by the same function. For example, if I just wrote something like Then, what will happen is that, the, that every element of the array will undergo the same function, namely in this case x maps to x by 1 plus x square. I am pretty sure most of you will agree that this is a very useful trick to use. Many calculations can be sped up a lot by using this. This is not the only advantage of arrays. but this will be one of the important uses we will put this through. Also, if you have two arrays, let's say for the time being another 3 by 2 array, which I create by using the np.array command again, let's say inside the np.array argument, I have to give a list inside list a three, with three elements, each of the three elements being two element lists. The 2 comma 0 comma 1 comma minus 1 comma sorry 3 comma minus 1 and now let's close the bracket this this is your array bb in case you have forgotten what aa was let me remind you this is the array aa this is the array bb now, if you want to add the two arrays together, all you have to do is say AA plus BB. And what it does is exactly what you expect it to do. It, every element gets added to every corresponding element. So, notice the 1 here and the 2 here has been added to yield the element 3. Similarly, the 2 here has been added to 0 here to be the element 2 and so on. So it's an element by element addition for two arrays which have the same shape. We have not defined the word shape yet but you can see what I mean here. There's three rows and two columns for both of them. Well, we can actually do something like a into bb. Now this is where many of you might start objecting because if you think of the arrays as matrices, which frankly I have been sort of doing so far, talking about rows and columns, you would realize that you cannot multiply two 3 by 2 matrices together according to the standard rules of matrix multiplication. But arrays are not really matrices. We can use them to mimic matrices, but they are data types which are independent on their own. And in this case, it's easy to see what will happen if you do a into bb. Just like addition was element by element, multiplication 2 would be element by element. So, just to bring back the a a bit. Oh, look, anyway, I can see the end of the array a here. This element has was 6. This, is my, this was minus 1. The product is minus 1 into 6. So it's element by element multiplication, not matrix multiplication. Let me give you another example. This one 
in uses something called a lin space function. This is a different function for creating arrays. Notice that the array function creates an array out of an iterable. You give it an iterable which comes into in pieces. NumPy will produce an array out of that. But the lin space function actually is slightly different. So let's say I use this command x is equal to np dot lin space say minus 3 comma 3 comma 1000. What this does is that it produces a linearly equally spaced array of numbers starting at minus 3 ending at plus 3 and how many numbers that is 1000 which is a third argument. We will have more to say about lin space later, but for the time being, let's just see how to use this array. This is a thousand element array, but we can do something very simple. Say I can just say np dot sign access. Then what happens is that each and every one of these thousand numbers, which were from minus three to plus three. NumPy carry calculates the sign of every one of them and produces a new thousand element array by s. So if you want to see what excess is, of course, thousand elements would be bit too big to see. But you can see the trailing end ends at 3. And this gap, if you think about it a bit, it's not very difficult to understand. If you want thousand elements between minus 3 to plus 3, that's a difference of 6. But you actually have 999 intervals for thousand numbers so the gap between your array elements in this case is actually 6 divided by 999 so these are the x's y's are the signs of those just to see whether this has been calculated right let me use the plt module actually remember this is the pi plot taken from matplotlib which we had imported before. PLT has many things in it. One of them is a plot command, plot function. In this case, I just give it two arrays, Xs and Ys. And I'm just trying to ask him to plot a graph with the numbers taken from the Xs array along the horizontal axis and number taken from the Ys array along the vertical axis. So, if I do that, this produces a matplotlib object, a lines object, but it doesn't plot anything. Matplotlib actually creates the plots that it wants to draw or what you want it to draw. And ultimately, you have to say plt.show to see the graph. And let's see what the graph looks like. You can see there's a neat sine function graph from plotted from minus 3 to plus 3. So, the fact that uh, we, the, what we claimed, that NumPy is actually calculating the sign of all these thousand x values, you can see a visual verification of that fact right now. Well, you can do better or you can do something more complicated, not necessarily better. For example, I could just calculate y is using this, a new function. So notice what is being done is that the NumPy is going to take each and every one of the thousand elements in the excess array and calculate sign of that particular element, of a particular element, add to that sign of three times that element divided by three and add to that sign of five times that element divided by five. And all that will happen in the blink of an eye without you ever having to write a loop or anything like that. It's done. And to see whether it has been done right, let's try plotting this. And if I show you this, you see this is what's happening. Some of you may realize that what I've done is I've written down the first three terms of the expansion of a square wave. And you can actually keep on adding more and more terms. 
especially by using a loop to control how many terms are being added. And you can show how the Fourier series for the square wave actually approaches the square wave. For the time being, let us return to basic arrays. Now that we are convinced that they are useful, hopefully, let us take a look at what basic arrays, what properties basic arrays have. Good. Just a reminder, this was our array AA. And the array as, well, in Python, not only the array, but everything is an object. Everything that you have in Python has attributes and perhaps methods tied to them. In this case, A, the array, has several attributes. All arrays have several attributes. And we can in, get to know what those attributes are by using the construct array name, followed by a dot, followed by the name of the attribute. The one attribute this has is ndim, the number of dimensions. And no surprises there. There are two dimensions here. This is an obviously two-dimensional thing. And it's saying aa.ndim is two. Well, you can also ask what is the size of this array? That again is not surprisingly six. There are actually six elements in the array. Well, how big is the array as far as memory of is concerned? Well, okay, before that, no, let's look at aa.n bytes. That tells me how many bytes is being occupied by this array. And the answer is 48. That is because I'm using a 6 byte. 64-bit machine, which uses 8 bytes or 64 bits to represent an integer. And in this array, we have 6 integers, each of them 8 bytes each. So that's a total of 48. A more important property, actually, is something called D-type. What this tells me is what is the data type of every element of the array. And here it's telling me D type is int 64. Notice that this is a huge, huge difference from lists. A list can have many different kinds of objects put in, in the same list. Arrays, on the other hand, come with, with definite data types. Either you have to specify the data type when you're creating it, or by default, it looks at what kind of objects are being put into the array and decides on the data type from that. And in this case, all of them are of the data type int64, which essentially means a 64-bit integer. So, now just to show what that, how important this int64 D type is, let's try changing the 00, zero element of this array which now remember is 1 to let's say 2.5. Python does it without a murmur. But now let's take a look at what the array A is. Notice that I wanted to push in 2.5 in this position. That's a 0, 0 position. But what I managed to push in was only 2 because the data type of an array is something you cannot change once it has been created. It has been created an int64, it will stay an int64. Try to push something in which is not an integer. It will try to convert it into, it into an integer. If it can't, it's going to complain. For example, if I try this, pushing a string with characters O, N and E in that position, is actually telling me that there's invalid literal for this. One cannot be converted to what the data type here is. So important lesson number one, arrays, arrays data type or D type, which is actually the type of every element in that array, cannot be changed once it has been created. Point number two, 
and its size also cannot be changed once it has been created. So remember we had this list L from which we created this array AA. We want, we can actually append in another list, let's say 7, 8 to this list. So list grows in size. On the other hand, try doing the same thing to AA the array and we met, meet with an ar error an nd array object the n dimensional array which AA is does not have any attribute like append in fact it has no attribute that it can change its size because the python array once it's created has a fixed size and a fixed d, d type now this actually is very very important so let me spend a bit of time explaining why this is so. Now if you remember your elementary quantum computer elementary computer science you would imagine that whenever a variable is created you actually store that variable in a location in memory. You can think imagine that there are boxes in memory and each box stores a particular variable. Now of course how big the box has to be depends on the type of data that's, that you have to put in. Now this is why in most languages you have to declare the type of a variable before you can use it because the compiler has to know exactly how much space to put aside for it. In Python however you have what is called dynamical typing. The interpreter decides what type of variable you put in by seeing what you are putting into it and using that information it chooses what how much space to keep aside for it in the memory. Now a list is very versatile. It can have different kinds of objects as its elements. What that means is that for a list if you know where the beginning of the list is, you have no easy way to find out where, for example, the tenth element is. Because how much space will be taken will essentially depend on what kind of elements you are putting. And now this is very important. Such versatility comes at a price. The price being manipulations with lists are typically a lot slower because of this. Yes, after all, the interpreter has to figure out exactly where a particular element of a list is. There is no easy way to know that. Python works wonderfully well with lists and there are many things you can do with lists that you cannot do with other conventional list-like objects in other languages because of this versatility. But this versatility, of course, makes the whole thing slower. In NumPy, there is one major objective which is doing mathematical calculations and doing them as fast as possible. Which is why the NumPy array has been designed not for versatility but for speed. And so by rule, every element of a NumPy array has to have exactly the same data type and the size has to be fixed forever once and for all so that Python knows exactly how much memory location to keep aside for that array. Not only that, if you know where the array begins, finding out the location of any particular element is simply a matter of adding or multiplying the, the index element for that object by the size of each element, which is fixed because each has the same data type, and then adding to the beginning value. So this makes by the NumPy array much, much more efficient in many calculations than the corresponding list, sometimes thousands of times faster. And this is why the NumPy array has only one kind of data type and a fixed size. So although NumPy arrays do look like lists and many of the methods are similar, they are not lists. And you should not talk about 
a list as if it's something like an array. It's a different kind of object altogether. And the sooner you appreciate that, the better it will be for your applications. Now, having said that, there is one attribute of the NumPy array which can be changed once you have created it. And that's something called the shape. In this case, the shape is also something which should be obvious. We have been saying that the array AA has three rows and two columns. A more precise thing would be to say that the array AA has three elements along dimension or axis 0 and two elements along axis 1. Since we are going to deal primarily with two-dimensional arrays most of the time, it's okay if you think of dimension or axis 0 as rows, axis 1 as columns. So 3, 2 essentially means three rows and two columns. This a dot shape attribute is actually a tuple, a, in this case a pair of numbers, which contains the values 3 and 2, which tells you how you actually view the array. Now this is a very critical thing. We will have a lot more to talk about this in the future. But an array is stored in memory, not in three rows and two columns, but just as a flat array, one element after the other. So the six elements are just put in one after the other. The reason why NumPy sees, shows you the array as three rows and two columns and actually works with the array as if it has three rows and two columns is because of this attribute shape. The shape attribute tells NumPy how to interpret those elements in the memory. So if you change it, for example, you can change it to 2, 3. And let's see what happens if you do that. What happens is now the same elements 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are arranged in two rows, three columns each. Notice 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 was a sequence that you had before. They were earlier arranged in three rows and two columns each. So you had 2, 2 in one row, 3, 4 in the next, 5, 6 in the last. Now you have 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The order of the array elements have not changed. In fact, internally nothing has changed about the storage. But all you have done is change the shape attribute so it's looking different. Well, you can change the shape to some other values. For example, 6, 1. There's six rows and one columns. So, notice that this looks typically like what we would call a column vector. Six rows in one column. You can also look at 1, 6. Which now actually is a two-dimensional array despite what it might look like. It's not a one-dimensional array. And you can see that clearly from the bracket fact that you have two square brackets here. So the corresponding list would have been a list within a list. But or in this case, one row, but this row with six entries. By the way, this is not the same thing as a flat one-dimensional array. If you look at the endim, there's still two. To get the one-dimensional array, what you would need is to change the shape to something which looks like this. So this is not two axes uh, one with six elements the other with one element elements or element this is only one axis with six elements remember the shape has to be a tuple and so even if it has only one element it has to be written down as six followed by a comma in a round bracket And now AA looks like 
this. Notice the difference between the previous view of the array AA, which was a two-dimensional array with one row and six elements. But now you have a one-dimensional array with only six elements. Something that's also verified by looking at aa.ndim again. This is a one-dimensional case. Now, can we change the shape to be anything we want? Of course not. For example, if I just tried NumPy gives me an error. It simply says that it cannot reshape an array of size 6 into the shape 4, 2. That makes eminent sense because a shape of 4, 2 would mean 4 rows and 2 columns in our language, 8 elements in all, and the poor array has only 6. So, of course, you can change the shape, but you have to remember the product of all the numbers that go into the shape has to give you exactly the size of the array. So, if your array is size 6, 6, 1 is possible, 1, 6 is possible, 2, 3 is possible, 3, 2 is possible, and lest we forget, 6, is also possible. Remember, the last one is just a one dimensional array with six elements, no rows or columns. Now let's go back to the presentation and see what we have next in store for us. I've talked about the d-type and why it is important that every element of an array have the same d-type. But what are the possible d-types? Here is a table which shows you what possible d-types you can have. The basic types are int for integers uint for unsigned integers. So if you only for, need positive numbers for some reason, you can use uint. Then there's boon, which takes only two values, boolean values, true or false. Note that true and false here are written in cap with capital T and capital F. These are Python keywords. Small t, r, u, e will not work. You have to write capital T, r, u, e to get the boolean true. Then you have floating point numbers and complex numbers as well. And notice that, you're, that you can actually specify various variants. If your system allows 8 byte integers, which is in 64, the 64 is the number of bits, then you can also use smaller integer sizes int 8, int 16, int 32, namely 1 byte, 2 bytes and 4 bytes respectively. And this of course is the 8 byte standard version. If your numbers are small, you could actually go in for these smaller sized integers and make calculation and data management a bit more efficient. Just to illustrate the difference that these different d-types make, notice that I can actually specify the d-type as part of the arguments for np.array. So here I have an example where I have tried to convert this particular iterable, the 1, 2, 3 list into an array, but I have specified the d-type to be int. This is a d-type is a keyword argument. I have to actually explicitly say or give the name d-type and then give its value after the equal to sign. If I do that, the, the array that is produced is just an array of integers. By the way, in this particular case, the d-type specification was unnecessary because the d-type would have been int anyway given the elements of this list. However, if I change the nb.array call a bit, I use the same list, but this time I specify d-type to be a float. And I see that the array I get has 1 point, 2 point, 3 point, 
three floating point numbers as elements, not three integers. So the size and the memory usage, etc., all of them are going to be different. I can, in fact, even change the dtype into a complex. And if I do that, given that the list that I gave had only integers, this will be converted into complex numbers but with zero imaginary parts. Notice that in Python, when we write a complex number, we write that as real part plus the imaginary part, the numerical value, followed by j. Uh, there is a reason why j has to come after the imaginary part and that is because in Python, valid variable names always start with letters, never with numbers. So if you have a number like 0.23j, Python knows that this is a complex number with imaginary part 0.23. If on the other hand you had written it as j 0.23, Python would have thought that you were trying to call or refer to a variable whose name is j 0.23. So just so that the, such a convention, confusion never occurs, Python insists that when you write complex numbers in this form, you write real part, in this case one point, plus zero point, followed by j. And why j rather than the familiar i? Of course, that's well known to everybody who has done, well, some electrical engineering applications, even in physics. Uh, after all, i stands for current in electrical engineering. So instead of using i for imaginary, we use j for imaginary. Now, once created, as I have said, a NumPy array's dtype cannot be changed. That's for the simple reason that the amount of space that has been reserved in the memory for a particular array is decided based on how many elements the array has and what dtype each element has. You can, however, create copies of a given array with changed data types. For example, you can take the you can create this array AA using our familiar call np.array followed by the list then followed by dtype equal to int. Once again, let me remind you that here you did not really need the dtype equal to int. Even without that, you would have, an have had an integer array. But now that we have an array of integers, we can create a new array BB by taking AA as the input to np.array. Notice that AA, just like the list here, is an iterable, it comes in pieces, and it's those pieces which are used to create the array BB. But now I have specified the dtype of the array as float. So the resulting array will have one point, two point, and three point as elements, not one, two, and three. Now, should we really worry too much about uh, this dtype business? Actually, we should. But before we go there, there's another way in which you can create a copy of AA and store it in BB, a new array, by using a method which is tied up with the array itself. So the array, remember, is an object. It has attributes, as we have seen. It also has a quite a lot of methods tied to it. As type is one such method. So you can use AA.as type followed by float. In the, as an argument, which says to take the elements of A, but save it in a new array with the dtype float, and your resulting array is 1.2 point, point, and 3 point, as before. Now, should we really care about NumPy dtypes? To see whether we should, let me go back to a, a live demo. So, let's create a new array, A. Remember, once again, the standard method is you just use np.array and in the argument, let's use the numbers 1, 0 and minus 1. So this is a list with three integers, but I'm going to use dtype equal to float. And as a result, despite the fact that the list that I have supplied as an argument to np.array 
has integers as its elements, the array A will end up having floats as the type of its elements. So just to check, let's take a look at A.D type. It is float 64, just what I expected the float type to be. And if you look at A, what is inside A, you get to see that it does have floats as elements. Now let's try to use the nb.sqrt function, the square root function from NumPy, on this array A. And rather obviously, you are going to run into trouble. The trouble is, the square root function is a new func, universal function, and it acts on each and every one of the elements of the array. So it acts on 1 to give you 1, acts on 0 to give you 0, but when it acts on minus 1, it's giving you a runtime warning. It says invalid value encountered in square root, and it does not give up completely, it does give you back the array with a square root of 1 here, square root of 0 here, but the third element is a square root, or should have been the square root of minus 1. What NumPy has done is it has returned a value of NaN, which stands for not a number. So, obviously, this is what you would expect. If you have a floating point number minus 1, you cannot calculate the square root. On the other hand, if I had done the same thing, taken the same list, converted it into an array, but this time with d type equal to complex, notice that a has these entries. The 1, 0 and minus 1 have been typecast to complex and, and what you have got is 1 point plus 0 point j, 0 point plus 0 point j, minus 1 plus 0 point j and so on. But now if you calculate the square root of A, what you get is perfect. You don't get an error, error at all. The square root of 1 plus 0 point j is 1 plus 0 point j. 1 square root is 1. 0 square root is 0. And minus 1 square root is 1 j, just as expected. So in this case, choosing the right data type actually allow, allowed you to do the calculation the wrong data type simply would have written not a number. 